year 2006 will give pleasure and offer a certain amount of pride as so many of you participated over our really extraordinary year at our beloved institution. Before we do that, however, I would like to appoint our secretary, Helen Weary, as chair of this meeting. There is a quorum present. One quarter of the membership is present either in person or by proxy. And now I will read the names of the directors who have been nominated for three-year terms. William H. Helfand, Howell K. Rosenberg, Elizabeth P. McLean, Peter Stallybrass, Martha Hamilton Morris, and Michael Zinman. Those are for three-year terms. And for two-year terms, Lisa U. Baskin and John W. LaValle. No additional names were placed in nomination by the membership, and the nominations are therefore closed. May I have a show of hands of the shareholders present who did not return their proxy cards. In favor of the slate, please raise your hands. Opposed, please raise your hands. Thank you very much. Are you opposed? No, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> These uh, nominees, the these nominees are now hereby elected. Thank you. And now, Mrs. Garvin, back again to give the president's report. Thanks. I slipped into these shoes as the president of this meeting last year. Six months is my tenure so far. Thus, many of the activities and accomplishments included in this report began their life under the able guidance of our former president, William Helfond. Where are you, Bill? He slept. He left. He left. <laughs> Tell him I saluted him. As you will be hearing shortly from our treasurer, 2006 was among our best years ever. We made a major effort to finish the drive to endow our program in early American economy and society and succeeded by the end of the year. The 5.5 million endowment includes 2 million contributed by the Fidelity Nonprofit Management Foundation, 1 million in the form of a We the People Challenge Grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and a 2.5 million from other foundations and individual donors. Many of you responded generously to our appeal for funds to accomplish this major undertaking and were truly grateful. I want in particular to single out my predecessor, Bill Helfond, whose whopping con contribution of one million gave us a huge boost when we weren't at all sure that we would make it. <laughs> and now we will have our treasurer's report. Uh, Chris, <laughs> I'd like to extend my welcome as well. My name is Bob Christian. I'm the uh, treasurer of the library company. Uh, thank you, B. Um, brief summary as to where we stand and, and our successes for 2006. Our endowment began the year 2006 at $18,500. Sorry, $18 million. I get lost in the zeros. Sorry, $18,500,000. Million was, what's a few zeros amongst friends? Um, our endowment ended the year at $23 million, $100,000. That's a $4.6 million increase. That's 25% increase throughout the year. Uh, that increase happened uh, uh, because of a couple different events. Our performance, our investment performance of the endowment was uh, a plus approximately 11% after all fees. Uh, we had a drawdown for, from the endowment for operations of $974,000, which is 5.2% of the market value of the endowment. Uh, and contributions to the endowment equaled about $3.6 million. So overall, with all those cash inflows, outflows, and investment performance, approximately a $4.6 million increase in the endowment. The operating budget for the year 
uh, was about uh, $2.5 million, of which $1.2 million, just under half, uh, represented salaries, taxes, and benefits, in other words, the, the cost of uh, employees. Uh, other major categories of expense included a little more than $200,000 for utilities, needed to maintain uh, our building at a constant temperature and humidity to protect the contents, uh, both the collections and the people, and about $150,000 for fellowship stipends, um, fellowship stipends associated with that flourishing program. Uh, any questions for me with regard to the Treasury? Hearing none, I'd like to turn the podium over to our director, John Van Horn. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. As you've heard from our treasurer and president, last year was pretty remarkable and one uh, not likely to be re repeated anytime soon. But during 2006, we did find time to attend to the uh, more usual array of programs and activities in addition to all of those celebratory ones. centenary of his birth and the 275th anniversary of his founding of the library company at the tender age of 25. The library company played a central role in all the celebrations, local and national. The library company was one of the five institutions comprising the Benjamin Franklin Tercentenary, which constituted the consortium that organized the major exhibition that was on view at the National Constitution Center from December 2005 until April 2006. It has since been traveling the country. It is now in Denver, will open in Atlanta in late June, and will close with a run in Paris beginning this December. Our other Franklin-related uh, uh, undertakings last year included co-publishing with our friends at the American Philosophical Society, Catalog of Benjamin Franklin's Library. I did it. Nothing happened. Underneath. Oh, Queen, it is this. This big, this big. No, Great. <laughs> the project was begun 50 years ago by Edwin Wolf II, but was completed in this important year by Kevin Hayes. The splendid, sophisticated exhibit, Benjamin Franklin Writer and Printer, mounted in our galleries, was co-curated by librarian Jim Green and trustee Peter Stallybrass. Oh, exhibit. One of our trustees there. More people in our exhibit. I can't see the people from this sidewise view. You'll have to yell out who you are. <laughs> Richard Dunn. And There's Mary. Dunn. Yeah. Richard Mary. Can't see you. This is Jim They're the boys. Peter. Jim and Peter. It really was well, it, a very They, they tell you up above. <laughs> they didn't tell us. And the handsome companion volume for that exhibition was written by Jim and Peter with partners at Oak Knoll Books and the British Library. And finally, for the Franklin year, the library company co-sponsored with the McNeil Center and Penn School of the Arts and Sciences the major conference on the Atlantic world of prints in the age of Franklin. We celebrated Franklin directly with all the above, but in, in this 275th anniversary of the founding of the library company, we wanted to celebrate the longevity of this library company, honor the trustees and patrons over the ages who have contributed to it its death in books and health and wealth by funding, and to remember as well those who have tended the readers and the precious materials. Trustee Helen Weary headed up a terrific com committee composed of trustees and staff members Helen and any is that Helen? There she is. There she is. Helen and Mike. Mm -hmm. It's printed above. Oh, I don't have to read it to you. Good. Good. <laughs> Trustee Helen Weary headed up a terrific committee composed of trustees and staff members and volunteers 
that orchestrated the fabulous dinner held last November 8th. On the exact date of our 275th anniversary, and held appropriately at the Old Bank Ben Franklin Hotel, several hundred people had fun, and our technology fund benefited to the tune of $100,000. And a couple of other items I hope you haven't missed. The August issue of Antiques Magazine, with text by board and library company staff, and which I must say was promoted and um, managed very efficiently by one of our board members, Davina Deutsch. And it illustrated the library company for a national audience, a range of colorful materials in several media, which are held at the library company as resources for ever-widening fields of study and research. And then there's Levenger, the company that sells, quote, tools for serious readers, end quote, made faithful reproductions of two things in our collection, and has been very successful marketing them, our 18th century leather fire bucket and our two-step library ladder. Through this interesting and entirely appropriate marketing project, several thousand dollars have been added to our bottom line. Other grand events during this, this uh, year there was the wonderful uh, celebration at the Franklin Institute on Benjamin Franklin's birthday, January 7th, on the anniversary of his birthday, January 17, 2006, and the library company played a major part with, uh, with the Franklin Institute in this. That is Bill Helpon and Betty, Betty Marmon. Bill. <laughs> And there's the, the inside. It really was a smash, that party. This is the party, right, John? Mm -hmm. I can't quite on. see it. No, no, no. Okay, go back to Ellen Cohn. Just a note about an initiative in the early stages. The rare books at the library company are well tended. Book conservation has its own skillful hands at work here. But there are some treasures of American art here also. Just look around and about at the very fine paintings in this room. They are important examples by premier American artists, and many are beginning to need attention. We've embarked on a survey of the condition needs of the paintings and decorative arts in the collections of the library company. The Schwarz Gallery has taken on, at their own expense, the restoration of two, the Thomas Birch Har Harbor scenes of New York and Philadelphia, which you can see over there, either side of the large, larger painting of Stenton. And as well, they have generously given their time and expertise to advise us on other conservation needs, namely the Benjamin West portrait of the Reverend Samuel Preston, which hangs prominently in the present exhibition. More of all this in the next year's annual report about the doings in this remarkable institution. We hope you will continue to be engaged now and forever by the activities and the excellence of the library company. Now I can say that you've heard from the president <laughs> and the treasurer that 2006 was, was a particularly uh, fabulous year for us. Uh, but we did uh, find time to attend to the more usual array of programs and activities in addition to all of these celebratory ones. Uh, for example, we hosted for the third time a summer seminar for school teachers uh, in the Cassatt House funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, this time on abolitionism. Fifteen teachers from around the country uh, came to study for four weeks in this intensive program under the direction of Richard Newman, a professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology. We also continued work on several important cataloging projects. With the support of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, we're completing the retrospective conversion, or recon as it's called, of several important parts of our holdings in order to add these records to our online catalog. These include books in Franklin's library, pre-1701 English, uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, English imprint. Two bindings collections, one donated by Michael Zinman and the other by Todd and Sharon Pattison. Our collection of sheet music, uh, about 30,000 graphic items listed on 50 different inventories kept by the print department, and works from the Michael Zinman collection of early American imprints. At the conclusion of this project, which will be in early 2008, a little less than a year from now, we'll be able to say that records of all of our pre-1880 printed works and most of our graphics collections are represented in the online catalog. 
We also continued work supported by NEH and the William Penn Foundation on the McAllister collection of Civil War era ephemera, a huge gathering of roughly 50,000 Civil War era posters, broadsides, pieces of ephemera, graphics, and manuscripts compiled by two generations of 19th century Philadelphia antiquarians, uh, John McAllister Jr. and his son John A. McAllister. When most of the work on this project wraps up at the end of this very month, we'll have made widely accessible for the first time what is possibly the largest collection of printed items produced for the home front during the Civil War. And as part of the William Penn Foundation grant for the project, we also acquired a new digital asset management system that will enable us to present digital images of our collection that will then be as easily accessible as our catalog records. And we've completed the migration of our online catalog from a system that had become inadequate for our purposes to a new and more robust system uh, called ALEF by Ex Libris. As part of that new system, soon a researcher will be able to make a single simultaneous search of the combined holdings of 27 libraries comprising the Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special mm -hmm. Collections mm -hmm. Libraries. So that's going to be quite a, a huge technological advance that will be coming into place very soon. Our research fellowship program is now 20 years old, and it continues to flourish. Uh, what began in 1987 as a very modest program of uh, summer uh, stipends for just a handful of scholars has now grown to the point where we award, as our treasurer mentioned, about $150,000 a year in stipends each year, uh, so that as many as three dozen scholars can come to Philadelphia for extended periods and work in our collections. These funds come from several sources. Uh, initially, it was income from an endowment that we began in the late 80s when the project was first getting started to mm -hmm. endow that, that core program. Uh, we also have income from other endowed fellowship funds that we have raised to increase the scope of the program, such as the uh, fellowships offered by the program in early American economy and society, both short-term and long-term dissertation and postdoctoral fellowships and the Albert M. Greenfield Foundation uh, Dissertation Fellowship, which is also a year-long award. And then we have some renewable grants, uh, such as uh, grants from the William Rees Company for research in bibliography and, and book history, and uh, the Health Fan Fellowships, one in the history of medicine and one in uh, American visual culture. So through all of these means, we keep a steady stream of researchers from many fields passing through our reading room each year turning out the latest works of scholarship, and in the process, further publicizing to those outside our immediate area the great riches that await all of these, uh, these scholars who venture to uh, 1314 Locust Street. We also continue to publish a great deal. In addition to the Franklin-related uh, projects that, that Mrs. Garvin mentioned, the staff of our print department uh, produced let's see. What am I looking for? Squeeze the button underneath. Oh, underneath. Great. <laughs> uh, the staff of our print department uh, last year produced this uh, wonderful volume, Center City, Philadelphia in the 19th Century. Uh, it's a book of historic photographs from our collection uh, that we co-published with Arcadia Books. And our, our Economy and Society program produced special issues of two journals last year uh, that reprint some of the papers given at the annual conferences held by Pease. One was the Journal of the Early Republic, and another was Early American Studies, and both of these contain these compilations of papers from those conferences. So we're still remaining pretty busy on, on the publication front. Other significant events of 2006 were the complete overhaul and upgrading of our website, uh, overseen by Nicole Scalessa. We had a meeting of the Junto, uh, library company members who support our acquisition program. Uh, that featured a talk by the noted collector of Franklinianna, Stuart Carew. Our annual meeting and dinner uh, in May featured a talk by trustee Peter Stallygrass about uh, the Franklin exhibition that was opening that day. We had a member's trip to New York to visit the Morgan Library and the New York University Library where a special exhibition of Stuart Carew's Franklin collection was on display. And we co-sponsored with the Philadelphia Federal Reserve Bank a talk on Franklin and paper money uh, given by Farley Grubb, a professor at the University of Delaware. Before I close, I'd like to touch on a few of the more significant acquisitions we made last year. 
Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, the Pattisons. Um, book collectors Todd and Sharon Pattison gave the library company their collection of books with decorated end papers, uh, which is really a marvelous collection. It consists of 164 titles with examples of all kinds of end papers from the 19th century, including type printed, stereotype, advertising, marbled, embossed, engraved, lithographic, and ruling machine papers. Uh, Todd Pattison spoke about the collection at a lunchtime talk that he gave here back in January of 2005, and now these very books are on our shelves because of their generous gift. This collection will be invaluable to anyone studying the little known aspect of this little known aspect of book production. It's fitting that two of our recent scholars and residents, Emily Pauly and Eric Stojkovich, are studying agricultural history because many of our new acquisitions relate to the history of agriculture. They include agricultural society transactions, reports from annual fairs, periodicals devoted to agriculture, and treatises on new farming techniques. This is a plate from one of our many agricultural how-to books depicting a romanticized view of American agriculture that, if it ever existed, had long since disappeared by the time this book was published in 1866. <coughs> one of David Durrett's many gifts to us in 2006 is this trade catalog published for G.H. and Barnett's Philadelphia file-making firm, the Black Diamond File Works, from 1874. It's an extremely rare catalog, no other copy is known, filled with detailed steel engravings illustrating the company's large and varied stock. A major acquisition purchased in part uh, with funds from an economy program came from the Franklin Institute's second and final phase of its library deaccessioning process, which is explained in more detail in our new occasional miscellany, which is at the printer right now and should be mailed by the end of next week. It also um, features one of the highlights, an early bookbinder's advertising uh, broadside. But this group of advertising trade cards represents another part of the acquisition, a large group of printed trade cards for businesses primarily in the Philadelphia area. The librarians at the Franklin Institute stipulated that institutions interested in purchasing the same lots would have to come to agreements among themselves as to who would get what. Uh, because the Historical Society was our rival institution in this case, we were able to negotiate favorable terms, dividing duplicates equally and taking turns choosing our desired pieces. Our share ended up being 67 trade cards in total, containing cards for manufacturing and service industries, some of which are shown here in this uh, collage. In addition to individual items, David Durrett also donated an entire collection of printed centennial ephemera, consisting of approximately six booklets, 75 printed circulars and broadsides, eight pieces of stationery, 20 trade cards, and six miscellaneous pieces, including an admission ticket, an embossed paper label, and a silhouette. This impressive collection fits perfectly with what we already have here concerning the Centennial. Uh, the Centennial saw the highest attendance of any international exposition of its day, some nine million visitors, and was also the only one that generated a profit for its organizers and investors. It was a highly significant event, not only for the city of Philadelphia, but also for the United States as a whole, as it was the first time our manufacturing capabilities uh, could compete on an international level, and just three years after a devastating economic crisis. This collection gives us a sense of the truly mind-boggling number of pieces of promotional ephemera generated by centennial exhibitors. One of the many printed certificates donated by David Dredd in 2006. This one is a membership certificate, circa 1795, for the Hibernian Society, a benevolent association founded in Philadelphia in 1771. Its allegorical-filled imagery, drawn by Irish immigrant John James Barillet, represents the opportunities to succeed in America, and features under the watchful eye of an eagle holding an American shield, female figures including liberty reaching out to the newcomers. Symbols of industry and agriculture flank the scene. And yet another David Durrett gift. This hand-colored lithograph commemorates the explosion of the Alfred Thomas at Easton, Pennsylvania in March 1860. Uh, disasters provide a popular, if rather grisly, subject matter for prints. And here, artist James Queen depicted the moment the 90-foot steamer blew up as it transported goods and people along the Lehigh River.
There we go. This lithograph, uh, let's see, we're talking about, uh, oh, horses were valuable commodities in early America for both work and leisure. Uh, men in certain localities often banded together to form anti-theft organizations to protect their property. We recently acquired several items related to the apprehension of horse thieves. Part vigilante and part recreational, uh, these groups were founded all over the country, operating as contemporary fire companies did, by protecting the property of dues-paying members only. This detail is from a broadside list of members of the Brownsville Persistent Company uh, in Doylestown, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, from 1842. Uh, the head of the broadside carries this wonderful woodcut illustrating members in hot pursuit of a criminal yelling stock thief and racing after him with their sticks in hand. Acquisitions such as these keep our collection growing and relevant to the needs of our present generation of scholars who make the pilgrimage to Locust Street. You'll be reading about these and many more in the annual report uh, for 2006, which will be sent out in the fall. Uh, we also have several items from Afro-Americana acquisitions that we, we came into last year as well. Uh, let's see, this is a mm -hmm. portrait of, uh, by Rem, probably by Rembrandt Peel, of uh, the Reverend Richard Allen, one of the more well-known founders of the Methodist American uh, Episcopal Church. This is a poster, uh, fundraiser poster for Wilberforce University in Ohio, the academic arm of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The church established the university in 1863 mainly to ensure the higher education of its future clergy. It was the intellectual and academic arm uh, of the denomination. I think that's it for acquisitions. Uh, of course, none of these accomplishments that I've been speaking of and that you've heard about from our treasurer and president, not the acquisitions, the fellowships, the programs, the exhibitions, the publications, the cataloging, or the digital initiatives, would have been possible without the hard work of our dedicated and talented staff, of our dedicated and talented uh, board of directors, and the generous support of so many of you uh, shareholders and friends. Uh, as one who's fortunate enough to be the director of this incredible institution, I deeply thank you all. And I do want to point out one thing. In the Logan Room, where we'll have the reception in a minute, uh, there's a panel on the, the east wall where we acknowledge donors of gifts of collections and also gifts of funds who have uh, helped us in significant ways over the past centuries. And since the meeting last year, we've added a few more plaques to that, uh, to that wall. And I want to draw your attention to them in particular. Uh, we've added new plates for gifts of collections uh, for David Durrett, uh, William Helfand and Charles Rosenberg, our vice president, who's up at Harvard at the moment, helping his wife settle in as the new president. And as far as gifts of funds, we've added plaques for uh, trustee Lois Brodsky and her husband Julian, um, trustee Susie Montgomery and her husband uh, Ned, um, trustee Martha Morris uh, and her husband uh, Wistar, uh, the Dorans Hamilton Charitable Trust, uh, Jerry and Marguerite Lenfest, and trustee Peter Benalil as well. So we've had quite a few additions since last year, which really speaks to uh, the generosity of our supporters and, and how much they've done to uh, enhance our, our institution. Before closing, I'd like to recognize uh, Phil Lapsansky's 35 years with the library company. He came in 1971. <laughs> uh, he came in 1971 to catalog the Afro-Americana holdings and has stayed here ever since. Uh, at the, uh, he's now our chief of reference and curator of the Afro-Americana collection, one of the best of its kind in the country. Uh, each year he writes up our acquisitions for the annual report uh, and occasionally mounts an exhibition. He's working on one now for next year uh, called uh, Black Founders, which we're mounting on the occasion of the bicentennial of the ending of the international slave trade by the U.S. and Great Britain. Um, literally hundreds of people who come here to do their research have been aided over the years by Phil's uh, knowledge of the collection. And it's always gratifying to me to read the marvelous tributes to him in the acknowledgments sections of all of these books that have, have been produced. Uh, Ten years ago, we sort of got ahead of ourselves and gave him a, a gold pocket watch for his 25th. Uh, we should have reversed the order, I suppose. So this year, we're reverting the form and uh, doing what we usually do, which is to give him a gift certificate for Borders Books. So Phil, please come up.
Nice time. <laughs> <laughs> that excludes my report. Thanks, Bill. <laughs> and uh, if there are no questions for me, I'll turn it over to our secretary. Are there questions for me? Part. Is there any business from the floor? Any old business? Any new business? If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. <laughs> Is there a second? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The meeting is adjourned. Please help yourself. Behind <laughs> 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 that.